In uh, 2005, we um, applied for an assistant professorship at the ETH. And uh, we, our strategy was to pitch with build work. Now we said, okay, if it's about digital fabrication, it must be about uh, uh, physical, I mean, this implementation of the digital in the physical. And the experiments like uh, the table, more on the, uh, let's say, artistic ironic side, and the house were very important to this because it was about showing an attitude that is, that is uh, about <coughs> using the digital netting the house is uh, is interesting in this respect to you could talk about the minimal ornament minimal digital ornament but if you really look at it then you find out that this is a perception engine you know so you have set up rules you know that are all about how you see things you know how wide your field of view is, where it's directed, where you include, uh, close, open, and so on and so forth. So our interest was into a, uh, a kind of digital materiality that would both be visually uh, attractive, sensual, but also functional, not in a now very Classical terms, or in a no, not in a in a classical, not in a uh, one-sided way, you know, but in a multifaceted way. Okay. And so we started look, looking for a machine that would allow us to go beyond what the machine that we were using until then uh, could be could do. And this for a very simple reason, because this was not about a project. You know, in a project you say, I have this amount of money and uh, this material and maybe this machine that belongs to this guy could help me doing this. Here it was about research. And uh, if, when you do research, you want, and you have to spend money in tools, you want these tools to be as sustainable as possible. So as open as possible to all the things that you would like to do in the future or like to test or to experiment with in the future. And the industrial robot that you see here uh, was the answer to this, uh, to this question because the industrial robot is uh, a machine that is back then was 50 years old, no high tech. Uh, it's the machine that had uh, changed the way the manufacturing industry works. Car, for example, you cannot imagine there is no a car from the 50s and a car from the 90s don't share much. They have four wheels and an engine and so on, but uh, other than that, they have completely different concept and the robot is part of this change. Without a robot, this wouldn't have, been, have happened. The robot is robust, the robot is uh, cheap or affordable, the robot is big, this is important, you know, well, if you wanted to address a space that is, in our concept, it would, would have to be at least the size of prefabrication, so what you can put on a, on a truck, roughly seven, eight made meters by three by three, something like this. And the robot mounted on a linear axis can do this. And the, let's say, the, 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 the center, the, probably the most important property of the characteristic of the robot for uh, us deciding buying it is its genericness. The robot is just six motors moving six axes uh, digitally. And uh, through these six movements, he has the possibility to reach points in space in a very simple way. Uh, and it's nothing more than that. You know, the robot comes without hand. You know, it's a, it, the robot is just pure possibility. And this openness fascinated us because all the other machines we knew are specific. They are designed to do a certain task in a very precise, efficient way. 
you know. And the robot is per definition inefficient, you know, and imprecise, you know, because he is too open. But he is anthropomorphic, so it's a sort of close to us, you know. And uh, you can give him a tool, and by designing, let's say, by deciding what tool, or even more by designing the tool, you design the process. So suddenly this level of intervention, if you just think in terms of freedom of design, is not only this is the data for the mill and the mill mills, but I say this is the design, and the design is composed by data that moves the machine and by a process that I imagine uh, that can include a, a complex tool, you know, and these two things together give uh, the process. And finally, and this is what this image, that is a, a, an artist image, uh, shows, we are convinced, and then now we are back to this idea of the tool and, uh, and uh, of the importance of the tool, we're convinced that the machine only makes sense together with, if, if so, together with us, with humans, you know. And this is sort of a, a critical statement because this machine is the prototype of the, you know, evil, it's the incarnation of industrialization as you know, we as a society understand it since uh, probably 200 years, you know. I think that in Uster, uh, what was it, 1840-something, they burned down the first uh, uh, textile uh, factories, and it was about the machine that they had in these factories. So the machine was the... And this, this story, rhetoric, has... Uh, uh, found uh, or continue to be dominant for good reasons until very um, few years ago. You know. And uh, we think that uh, robotics in the contrary, you know, uh, in the contrary of uh, mechanic machines that just do a job, you know, that also a human could do and so our direct replacement for this human and are in competition, we think that these sort of machines do not compete with humans, but integrate the work of humans. So we can understand them as being very sophisticated tools, you know, like the craftsman. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you have nails and don't have a hammer, then you have a hard time, you know, even if you are a good craftsman. You know, so you need this tool, and if you're a very good craftsman, then you invent the hammer, or if it's already there, then maybe you tune it, you know. You make a better hammer that makes you a better craftsman, that allows you to nail in a more sophisticated way, or faster, or whatever, you know. And the same relationship, I think, will have to be established between us. And if I talk about the human, I talk about the designer, the architect, the engineer, the programmer, all the people that are needed and, and crucial in such a process. Now, just to illustrate quickly what, how this relationship could be, and this is the first material we started to work with uh, in 2006 when we got the robot brick, because we said, what is the oldest building block of industrial building block of architecture is the brick. You know, it's an industrial uh, piece product since its uh, origins 10,000 or more years ago. And uh, what is, what can the robot, what can the robot do very easily, also for us, you know, just to grip something and to place somewhere, somewhere else, you know, pick and place. And these two things together uh, give you a brick wall or a brick bond. Now on the left you see a, a human, this was a former student and a collaborator of us. Uh, he does not program something in the first place, but he builds by hand in order to find out what the rules of this material are. And uh, if you look at what he's doing, he's 
augmenting the knowledge, the implicit knowledge he has about break bonds. I think everybody f here, even if you didn't never do this manually, you have a concept about how this works. Nobody would intuitively start to build on the last row, you know, to, to you know, just because you know what gravity is. So this sequencing and also this uh, bond rules so that things have to overlap in order to create stability are sort of implicit, at least to us architects, but I think to, to humans in general. Uh, but he's trying to extend, to, to, to understand how, how far out could he cantilever a piece until it tips over, what are the the tolerance is his need, needs to respect because bricks are not all the same size, you know, in order to avoid collision. So he, he builds up experience. And on the right, you see a, a program, a very basic program. Programming is uh, uh, nothing else than uh, data types, variables, and control structures control structures that allow you to decide if something should be executed or not, talking about if-else. And one uh, important control structure is the loop, in this case a for loop. There's nothing else than do something, repeat doing this until a certain uh, uh, rule is met. And uh, if you nest two loops into each other, then, interestingly enough, you just have a brick wall. You know, the brick wall is the exact physical correspondent of two nested loops, because building a brick wall, you have to think about the process, not the result. But the process is, you have a stack of bricks, you pick one, you put it somewhere, and then you have a rule, pick another one and put it next to the last one. And repeat this until you meet you know, a certain length or the wall. And then the first, the inner loop is over because you have met, and then it jumps out in the outer loop. And the rule there is move up one row. What in the physical world is sort of logic, because if you would not move up, then you would collide with the existing one. So it's, of course, you, you need the support, you know. But the rule is just move up and then move by half a brick. And then you are again in the inner loop and you repeat this. So this very beautiful, simple uh, s correspondence between the physical execution of something and this uh, uh, elementor uh, program allows to, if now, if, 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 if you would just put this rule, you would have a, a straight brick wall. You know, but now what he can do with its rules, he finds out, he can add some, and you see it there, the bold things, he makes some calculations in there. So for example, he calculates a rotation based on the rotation of the last brick, so he can start to manipulate the, this data. Of course, he has to make, take care that things still are consistent, so you cannot just start to move things around wildly. This is the reason why he understood how things work. You know. And with this algorithm he produces, uh, instead of having just uh, the position of the brick shifted by one brick and so on, he gets one position for every brick, and they're all different. Now they are very small, but you can imagine this is complex numbers with uh, a lot of uh, numbers uh, after the comma. And this information here would be extremely hard to execute for a human. So what before was sort of easy because you just needed to know a rule next to the last one, plus you had a visual reference that allows you to put it, you know. If you would get this list as a mason, then you would say, forget about it, you know, because for each single of these uh, points in space, I have to measure to make sure that uh, that uh, that thing is at the right place. And I would get extremely slow, and I would start to make mistakes and so on. While for the machine, because the machine doesn't care, you know, the robot doesn't care where he puts, as long as it's in his reach, you know, there is not easier or harder position, 
There is no simple number. There is no visual reference. It's all the same. For him, you just feed him these numbers. He just puts the brick there and you reach a, and we call this collaboration or synergy. You connect this human act of designing rules, of designing architecture with the machining act of building. In a very direct way, again, we are here, it's like the phone, you know, application thing, but just another level. And this is the result. And I think this is maybe together with the interference cube, uh, moment when we started to think of, to reflect, what is this, you know? Because you could say, okay, it's just bricks rotated. It's just bricks rotated. At the same time, it's, they're rotated in a, in a, in a way, in a fashion that uh, we only know or knew back then from two-dimensional artifacts. Computer graphics, for example, had developed this aesthetic since maybe the beginning of the 90s, but we never saw it in three dimension, you know, because this is now, this is just a picture, but if you are in front of such a wall, if you move in front of it, this starts to move, you know, and uh, you sense that on one side, it's this very familiar archaic material that you know, because it's everywhere, not so much in Switzerland, but in other countries everywhere, and, uh, and uh, at the same time, the logic of the organization of this material is, is a alien, you know, belongs to the domain of the digital. Plus, it's clear that this, you could not execute this manually. So you're not automating something, you know, but you are creating something new. And this is for us also now from an ethical point of view is very important, you know. We often, on a superficial way, get confused with uh, automation, you know, and there we have really to defend ourselves and say, of course, automation is there, automation is a trend, but we don't care about automation, you know. Automation will happen anyway, somebody else will do it. We are interested at exactly this point where the use of machines, automation machines, allows to change things radically. And this is the thing that here happens.